The content you're about to enjoy comes from the archives of The Best You. We're devoted to the very best in personal development, with a platform and resources dedicated to inspiring and changing people's lives. At The Best You, we work with the world's leading writers and trainers on the evolution of the self and people whose journeys have been affected by their work and words. These Best You Expo talks are recorded in front of a live audience in a live event. We highly recommend that you focus on the message. As they say, what you focus on expands. Enjoy. Ismail Kala. Ismail is a life and business strategist, best-selling author, and international speaker who specializes in personal development and mindful exponential leadership. Born in Santiago de Cuba, Kala graduated with honors from both the Universidad de Oriente and York University and received a personalized training from renowned international leaders such as Robin Sharma, John C. Maxwell, and Deepak Chopra. Kala is also the Kala program presenter on CNN in Spanish and has over 25 years of media experience in Cuba, Canada, USA, and Mexico, specifically at Televisa, Univision, TLN, and American TV. Ismail is a phenomenal guy. He's tremendously knowledgeable when it comes down to television, and he is, uh, well, extremely well known. He has millions of followers on his Instagram and all his social media. I've known Ismail for quite a few years now. He spoke at the Expo. I've met him in London, and uh, I'm sure there's loads of things we're going to be doing together. But what I love about Ismail is to see how much he's growing and how much he's evolving uh, with all the phenomenal things that he's doing. So enjoy his talk. Thank you so much. For those of you who just are wandering in and you don't know me, my name is Ismael Cala. I'm originally from Cuba, beautiful island of Cuba. I left Cuba when I was 28, 28 years old. I went to Canada, imagine from the Caribbean into the polar weather. And Canada was a beautiful second home for me until 2003 that I decided once again, explore into the unknown and came all the way driving from Toronto to beautiful Miami, closer to by tropical weather. I've been a broadcaster my entire life, working for CNN in Espanol since 2001 until 2016, when I quit the show, the interview show that I was doing called Kala, my last name. Many of you are here because probably you met me through the screen, the TV screen. Yes or no? Yes. But I quit the show because I needed a personal break, time out from the news, from the outside world. And I was interested in knowing a little bit more about my personal story. How can I reprogram my life to be a better leader? And how can I help so many other people to transform their lives to be better leaders in their families, communities, countries, in society in general? That's why I'm here today sharing with you not expertise from my academic research. I'm sharing with you life lessons that transformed my destiny. A destiny that's for so many people closer to me, my own family, they actually believed that I was going to end up being a schizophrenic, suffering from mental illnesses because that's my inheritance. How I didn't, I will tell you today. And this is a concept of mindful exponential leadership in the VUCA world. So for an hour, we'll be talking about this world that we are living in. Why? Because this is a bubble. The Best You Expo is a bubble. It's a tribe of people thinking in alignment, looking for the same solutions, trying to be better. But when you come out into the real world, the 95% of people are not looking for the same. Yes or no? So you have to be functioning in those waters, which is not the nice environment that you find here at the Best You Expo. That's why my concept of mindful exponential leadership combines the two worlds. Outer world through exponentiality and technology, everything that's going on in our lives, where for so many people, the telephone is not an accessory. The telephone is the master of their lives. 
They are enslaved to the telephone or the tablet or the computer. That's the outer world. And leadership these days, you have to master the outer world and you have to master the inner world. Yes or no? Who you are. Who you want to be. How much your past is still writing your present and determining your future. Because life is about choice. The choice that you made to show up today. And I will make your time count. It will be a great investment. Mindful exponential leadership in the VUCA world. Why? Because VUCA is the characteristics of four elements of our present world. But look what's going on in the world. A lot of people are searching for happiness more than success or well-being. This is an interesting fact. So many more people, actually this is from Google Latin America. So in Latin America, a lot of people are looking more into happiness than into the concept of success or well-being. And for me, this is interesting. Why? Because when I was a kid, I was told a totally tale of horror about success and happiness. I don't know if it's the same that you received, but even my mom, my dad, my teachers told me, Ismael, be a good student. Please study hard. Because when you finish university and you have your diploma, life will be easier. They will pay you a lot of money. You will feel that you are successful and then you will be happy. Yes or no? And happiness was at the last of the road. Nowadays, we know that that's not true. It wasn't true then, but I buy into it. But now, a lot of people are searching and they see that well-being, which is comfort, quality of life, possessions, everything that you can have outside of you to make your life better is not enough. So sorry for the presentation. I don't know what's going on. Oh, this is another one. Okay, so let's forget about the presentation. Let's forget about the presentation. Okay, it's good? Okay. <laughs> let's see if it works. Yes. In the last five years, more countries have searched happiness over success, which means that a lot of people like us are interested in not suffering. They are interested in investing in ways to make our lives happier, more resilient, like plenty of good moments to share and to collect. This is interesting because this is a fact. I'm talking to your hemisphere, which needs always data because we are scientists. We live by the wrong paradigm of seeing is believing. So that's why I'm talking to that part of your brain to convince you that you made a good investment today. The next question is, and this is not in Spanish because let me tell you in Spanish, to translate this question, we need like probably 20 words. Yes or no? And English is beautiful in that sense that, you know, uh, play with words like this, it's an amazing question. It's your mind full at this moment or... Are you mindful? Take 30 seconds just to observe, to sense. Breathe in. Ah, breathe out. You can close your eyes just for 30 seconds. You will not be teletransported from here anywhere else. I promise that. But it's just to become a witness, a silent witness of who you are and how you feel at this exact moment of your life. Look at this illustration. This is your mindful. It's full of events, traumas, things that you need to do. It's between past, passing by present, and going into the future, and going back to past. That's the state of mind that most of us have during our day, yes or no? Because we are mostly living in automatic pilot. Not manually taking control of our breathing, of our consciousness, of our decisions. 
most of our times are dedicated to just following by second nature things that our brain already know and we already have in memory. A mind that is mindful is a mind that is observing itself. How do you know that you are mindful right now? Because you are serene, you are not stressed, you know that there are thoughts coming by, but you don't entertain them, you just observe them, and there is a requirement to be mindful. No judgment. No judgment. Because your bodies are here, but is your mind here without judgment? Maybe many of you are thinking, who is this guy? You are still judging. You are not open to the experience. Why is he wearing tennis shoes? If you have that narrator on right now, that dictator inside your head, you are not mindful. But you are human. And that's a good thing. We have to allow ourselves to be human, to be vulnerable, to understand what, that we are not perfect. That's why I love the title of this expo, The Best You. Because right now, your mind could be full. But in five minutes from now, you could be mindful. That's the beauty of life. Look at this picture. Who is a parent here? A dad, a mom. Yes. So you know that when your baby has this face, probably that baby needs to go to poo. Because the baby is constipated. But why so many of us at some point in our lives have this face? Eh? And this face for most of us has nothing to do with stomach pains or stomach constipation. It has a lot to do with mental, psychological, emotional, energetic, or spiritual constipation. Yes or no? So now is the moment for the laxative in this room. Look around, look at the faces of your neighbors, and With love and respect, ask the person, are you constipated? Please, don't be shy. Please, come on. This is a laxative. It takes only four, five seconds. When you ask a person, hey, are you constipated? Suddenly, that person switches the brain into manual, and that person realizes that you are asking a question that needs a little bit of relaxing of the facial muscles to not look constipated. So this is great. So this is my first tip for you today. Look every single day in the mirror for constipation signs. Because your face won't lie to you. Your face won't lie. You cannot be the best you if you don't go in front of the mirror and say, am I constipated? Is this the way that I will walk out my house and go into the world, not bringing the best of me? We have that responsibility. Life is so short. So we need to be responsible of our states of being, states of mind. And I love that everybody now is smiley face in this room. You know that people in English, when they ask me, how do you pronounce your name? It's Ismael in Spanish. But in English, it could be Ishmael. And I say, well, remember two ways that you can remember my name. Smile, Ismael, or I smell, which I don't. <laughs> But a lot of people suddenly say, oh yeah, I will remember you forever. Ismael, yes, smile, or I smell. It doesn't matter. Make people remember your name. If your name is kind of hard to grab. I'm talking about constipation, ladies and gentlemen, because I didn't get here to the Best You Expo out of inspiration. No, I wasn't that lucky. 
I got here to this stage being 48 years old out of desperation. I was an unhappy, constipated kid for most of my childhood and adolescence. But I didn't notice that I was because I didn't have the tools, the knowledge, the wisdom I do have now. So I did an exercise that I want you to do. And probably you will have more, more pictures than me to do it. I went into my family album. Few pictures. Remember, I'm from Cuba. Communist country. Not a lot of cameras. Less roles to develop. So believe me, those few pictures are the only ones I have from my childhood or even my parents' wedding. Look at that picture. It's the night of my dad a mom saying, I do, I love you. If you look at those faces, could you see happiness in there? Because when I looked at that picture, I see constipation. I see constipation. But then I said, well, maybe my mom and my dad were really nervous when they were signing. I do. But maybe when the wedding was over and they got into the car, going into the honeymoon, they were already happy. We are leaving all these annoying people. We are going to be together. We are going to finally do whatever we'll do because my mom didn't have sex before marriage. She told me that on CNN when I interviewed her live. <laughs> Believe it or not. I asked the question, mom, did you get virgin to your wedding night? And she said, unfortunately, yes. It was your father who didn't want to do it before. And it was so interesting. And the entire audience like, oh my God. Well, that's my mom. I'm proud of her. But then look what happened before going into the honeymoon. Another constipation scene. I asked my mom, mom. Go back into your wedding night because I'm, I'm making sense of my life. I need you to tell me how happy were you that night. And she said, totally unhappy. It was like hell, Ismael. It was not a good night. And I said, well, I can tell. Look at the pictures. No smile. So that's why I say I was born into this world out of a constipated marriage. If you're interested in speaking, exhibiting, or getting involved in the largest personal development expos in the world, contact us today at www.thebestyouexpo.com or send us an email to info at thebestyou.co. Oh, poor me. Well, that's what I thought when I became a victim for so many years of my old story. But now the new me says, thanks God. Oh my God, that allowed me to do all the work that I've done. And now I have consciousness. And now I don't live in an automatic pilot like 95% of the population. So this story is wonderful. But look at the pictures. No smile. No smile like as, as a baby. No smile when I was six years old. I'm holding the hands of Puchita. Her name is Rosa. I haven't seen Rosa in over 40 years. So I don't look. I, don't, I, I really don't know. And I don't want to imagine how she looks right now. This is the Puchita that, that I remember, that little girl. These are my brothers. They were, or they are twins. I'm the oldest one, only 14 months older than my twin brothers. And I say, I have the best brothers that I can ever imagine. Why? I never played with them. I never fought with them. Because they did everything by themselves. They play together and they have arguments together. So I was totally ignored by them during my childhood. And this is the breakthrough moment of my life. That picture that my grandmother said, Ismael, we can put that picture in front of the sugar jar. No cockroach will approach. <laughs> that picture, being 15 years old. This is my father, my twin brothers. As you can tell, my father is missing an arm. He lost his hand, his left hand, when he was eight years old, playing with sugar cane in a trapiche. Trapiche is a machine that extracts the juice of sugar cane. And, you know, he just put a sugar cane into the trapiche and 
the trapiche kind of got his hand in. Three hours later, he went to the hospital and afraid of a major infection, they amputated the entire left arm. When I was born, I was like looking at my father and saying, oh my God, poor, poor dad. Why he had to go through that terrible accident? Nobody in my family talked about the accident, not about the suicides of my relatives, not even about a possible mental illness or brain disorder history in the family that brought to them to decide to hand themselves up. So the fear, you know, of shame, guilt, resentment, public humiliation was my major enemy when I was a kid and a teenager. But when I was 15, I got the opportunity to grow up so quickly because my mom said, you have to go to see your father at the hospital. And my father was hospitalized in a psychiatry ward at a hospital after being treated with electroshocks. Okay, after a panic attack or a nerve breakdown or a psychotic episode, call it the way you want it. And I was 15 and I saw my father being almost a zombie, no consciousness after electroshocks. And that moment was a defining tipping point for my life because I said two things, God, help me, please make a life intervention in this brain, in this mind. I promise I will do anything in my power to change the course of history. And the second thing I said, looking at my father, was kind of hard for any son that has to make a decision being 15 years old. I said, forgive me, Father. I didn't say it verbally. I said it to me mentally. Forgive me, Father. But when I look into the mirror, I cannot look at you being the example that I want to be when I grow up. That's hard. Because every one of us want to grow up and have mom and dad as a paradigm, as an aspiring figure that you want to kind of be like. I couldn't do that. Why I'm telling you this? Because at that moment, I felt that I was alone. I couldn't tell people. I was in a life crisis. My mom brought me to a psychiatrist. The, the psychiatrist said, well, this kid, you know, the family history is affecting him. So he has the same problem. So let's put him on a pill. Every pill, every day for a year. And I took it. And it kind of balanced my brain chemistry. But what the pill didn't do is to change my history, my personal story, the decisions that I needed to make differently. So I said one year later, Mom, you know what? No more pills. I'm going to make sense of my brain. I'm going to study what's going on. I promise you, I'm not going to be like my family. I'm going in a different course. I'm telling you this because a lot of you are here at the best you, and you're humans, all of you, unless one of you says, no, Ismael, I'm totally an alien. You know, I'm not from this planet. And I could say, well, if you're not human, probably you never were depressed. But if you are human, at some point in your lives, you were depressed and you will be depressed. These are the signs of modern burnout. In Japan, they have the word karochi. And karochi means death from overwork. Imagine that. Death from overwork. Because it's a society that is hyperproductive. It's so disciplined. I love Japan. But believe me, I just want to be a tourist there. Not a citizen. Because last year, a 25 year old girl working for an advertising agency committed suicide and the family put a lawsuit against the agency because it was ruled as karochi she was working over 150 hours per week to meet the deadlines and all the projects that she needed to complete 
What happens in other countries like Scandinavian countries? They have the opposite word. Abbas glad. Repeat after me, please, in the classroom. Abbas glad. Abbas glad. That means happiness at work. Totally opposite concept. In Japan, they have karochi. In Sweden and Denmark, they have Abbas glad. Some people may sense that they have to go to work and actually be happy while working. Be happy while you are being productive. But here in the United States, in the Americas, do we have that concept? Of course not. A lot of people associate working with a battle, struggle, sacrifice, not an environment that I need to feel happy at. Even in Cuba, and this I have to say it in Spanish, when I was younger, people asked me, Ismael, ¿cómo te va en el trabajo? How is work? And I used to answer, ahí voy, en la lucha. You know, I'm in there, in the struggle. And then I said, well, this is like a dramatic Mexican telenovela. No, 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 no. I have to tune down a little bit the drama. So I used to answer, the revised answer was, how is your work? And I say, ahí voy, en la luchita. <laughs> well, here I am. In the little struggle. So, you know, a little less. But now I know that to be the best you, you have to be happy while you are productive. Just for one major reason. After sleeping time, productive time is the second largest chunk of time of your lifetime. So imagine that you are going to waste all these hours that you need to be happy waiting to finish work to feel that you are going to be happy. The weekends, on vacations, or just when you get home after work. That's a wasted life. That's not the life that I want for you. And that's not the life, of course, that I wanted for me. That's why I quit it. In the moment that I said, this is success, power, money, reputation, but it's not coherent with what I want right now from my soul, of course not from my ego. My ego was saying, CNN, are you crazy? Are you quitting CNN? Interviewing presidents and Nobel Prizes and you know, writers and famous celebrities? Are you crazy, Ismael? And my soul had to say, shut up, dictator, dictator, shut up. You are not in charge right now. So I want you to be in charge. I want you to understand that you are not going to change the situations of your life. Not all of them. You have no control in this VUCA world about how volatile, how uncertain, how complex, and how ambiguous this world is right now, and this world will continue to be. Raise your hand if you think those traits are the major characteristics of the world we are living in today. Raise your hand. Great. Interesting because the VUCA concept, the acronym, was coined in the 90s, last century, by the strategists of the U.S. Army College here in the United States after the Soviet Union and the socialist bloc collapsed. And they said, who is the enemy now? In front of the United States, who is the enemy? Well, anybody could be the enemy now. So that's why they said the world has become major on these four characteristics. And that was in the 90s. Then in the year 2000, VUCA squared. Why? Internet came along. Internet, that beautiful tool that we have right now. It made the world more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And then it's VUCA exponential right now. Why? Because of the latest revolution of social media. Because internet existed, but you didn't have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat. So your voice was limited. But now your voice is unlimited. 
You are not longer a linear, incremental, local citizen of the world. Now you are a global, exponential citizen of the world. Why? Because we all have the power to be heard. We have social media. So this is not a bad thing. VUCA, it's kind of not good, not bad. You have to make sense of it. Technology. Look at technologies impacting our everyday life. But technology is a blessing, but could be a curse. For so many people, technology right now is the major distractor against higher, high performance in their lives. For so many people. For some other people, technology is the great accessory to be higher producers, overachievers, to be more mindful because they are using the telephone to have yoga applications, mindfulness meditations, you know, like applications, apps. Like I'm, I'm using the Fitbit because it's a great accessory to remind me that I haven't walked a lot, what I committed to myself, 10,000 steps per day. So this is a great accessory. I don't have a regular watch because, I mean, at one point I said, why right now am I wearing a watch? It's for status? Is that a symbol that I can buy this kind of brand? Or this is really helping me to be better? So you have to ask these questions. Because these questions are the ones that will bring you to the upgrade that we need to have every single year. Like the best you expo could be the mark for you to do like a summary and saying, in one year, how much better am I? What have I done in the last year since I went to best you expo? in 2017, that now I feel I'm a better iPhone. Imagine that you are an iPhone and that every 18, 24 months, you are bringing to the world a newest, a newer version of who you are. 60 seconds in the VUCA world with technology. Look at the number of transactions interactions, operations that take place in 60 seconds in your outer world. 60 seconds. And now I can tell you, stop. Stop and observe how much life is getting in and out of you in 60 seconds. Let's close our eyes and let's do a minute, a minute of mindfulness. Everything that you have in your hands, put it somewhere else. So your hands are free, totally free. Close your eyes, feel your head relaxed. Your shoulders are relaxed as well. You are sitting straight in comfort. But not too much comfort. I don't want you to fall asleep unless you really need to sleep right now. Just for the first 15 seconds, don't intervene on your breathing. Just observe your breathing, the rhythm of your inhales and exhales. Become a silent witness of your mind. Do not entertain any thoughts passing by. And now, just sense, sense the sounds around you, sense the temperature in this room sense the sensations of your body 
acknowledge them do not judge them and now everything that you sense even if you label that experience or sensation positive or negative just surrender let them go so this is the second step the first one is sense the second one is surrender and the third one is out of gratitude sends three concrete reasons to be totally grateful right now. Do not think, just sense them. Feel them. Three concrete reasons to be grateful for who you are right now. Let your body and your mind Get totally filled with gratitude, with that sensation that there is nothing wrong in your lives right now. That everything is in divine order. And with your heart open and in total gratitude, just from the center of your heart, Bring smile to your face. Even if your rationality tells you, I, I have no reason to smile, just do it. Just bring that desire to be happy, to be smiling right now. And when I count from one to five, you will expand that reason to be smiling from the bottom of your heart a bigger smile one and you smile more two three smile because everything is a miracle you're alive four five enjoy that state of being of gratefulness, total gratitude, serenity, happiness, alignment. Bring back your attention to your body, to the room temperature, to the sensations of your body right now. Observe the rhythm of your breathing. And when you feel ready, slowly, you can open your eyes. Thank you for the experiment. How do you feel? How do you feel? I can tell you one thing. I can feel right here the energy of all of you. I don't know if you can feel the energy around you, but it's a more peaceful, less agitated energy. Why? Because your brain, it's more serene. The agitation of your cerebral waves, your brain waves, is slower. That's what we need to do in the VUCA world. Because if you live in turbulence, the outside turbulence, you need to understand that you need to be as calm as the pilot of the plane that will go through the turbulence during the flight. 
Having promoted more than 600 speakers and more than 65,000 people attend my seminars and courses and workshops and expos, having read so many books and attended so many courses, I really realized that the basics of personal professional growth is based on the power of the question, asking yourself empowering questions. Read my new book, The Question, Find Your True Purpose. It's based on my work, 30 years of entrepreneurship, all the experiences that I have, my manifesto, and what's really important. So for more information, go to www.thequestion.co. It could be turbulent times outside, but inside your mind, it has to be calm. And we have that choice. That's why I'm talking to you, because I was a victim. I was a victim for so many years. You know, I said, oh my God, poor me. Why I was born in this family? Why my grandfather committed suicide? Why my father even attempted to commit suicide until I rewrote the story of my life from being there, becoming the silent witness and understanding that everything that happened in my life had a reason for me to thrive. You know what I discovered? Unfortunately, it's not in English, the book. It's in Spanish, El Poder de Escuchar, The Power of Listening. When I was writing that book from a perspective of not being me, you know, the center of the universe of my own life, just observing, you know what I discovered? A revelation. God took my father's arm to give me life. Because when my father was studying at the Soviet Union, He attempted to commit suicide with only one hand. And his roommates got into the room and saw my father standing with a chair and with the sheets trying to hang himself. But he couldn't succeed because he only had one hand. So for so many years that I was playing the victim, Poor me, poor me, poor me, poor my father, poor my father. I couldn't see the seed of greatness. Even if in that tragic moment of my father's life. So we have the choice to rewrite our personal story. But we have to take control of the computer. And the computer is here, it's the brain. It's not your phone. It's not the tablet. It's not the supercomputer that you bought from Apple. Your greatest computer is this, your brain. So we have to invest time studying how the brain works because I fixed mine. I fixed mine. But why? Because for me, not every single day is a wasted day in the sense that I know that every single day I have to take the garbage out because this could become a landfill of toxic residuals. I have no choice. So I had to create that discipline. I tell people, you want to be abundant. You want to create an empire. You want to have land. You want to have, you know, farms and buildings And yachts, mansions. Do you know which one is the most expensive piece of land that you will possess? This. This little space inside your skull is the most expensive real estate land that you could ever afford. It's not outside. It's here because everything that you do, that farming that you do inside will create the empire outside. So this is VUCA. And let me tell you, you can look at this on Google. That's why I'm going through this pretty quickly because information is now accessible everywhere. Maybe you haven't heard of VUCA, but now you you, you know, so you can go on Google. The Institute for the Future said, well, we have a problem or a situation. We live in a VUCA world. What can we do? And they created the VUCA counterweight, led by Bob Johansson. And they said, volatility, we as leaders, not as victims, we need to have more vision. Uncertainty, yes, you have to 
embrace uncertainty. Abrazar la incertidumbre because nobody will tell you every single detail of your life from now on. Not even an astrologist. And even if the astrologist knows, I don't want to know because I will get predisposed. I don't want to know. I want to know that I can make things happen for myself. That I love uncertainty. That uncertainty is my friend, not my enemy. Clarity. Because we live in a world that is more complex, we need more clarity. You know, the most important thing is to know who we are. That's, that's a great question. Who am I? Who am I? I'm still in the search of that. But the second most important question is, what do I want? What really do I want? Because sometimes we believe we know what we want and we drive ourselves crazy for the new house, for the wedding, for the vac vacation. But those are just symbols. And then we got them. And then after a while, we are empty again. So that question is really important. What, that's why we need clarity. What the heck do we want as a human being? And the last one, ambiguity, we need agility. Now you can pay $10,000 to go to Harvard for a week in an executive program that they will teach you learning agility. Why? Because people resist change. And change is the only constant in the world. So we have to be agile. That's why you see Kala, which is my last name, because my team of researchers and I said, we need to tropicalize a little bit VUCA and the VUCA counterware. And we created the Kala Life Method, which is actually nothing new in my life. I have been living through this process my entire life. The Kala Life Method is simple but profound. If you want to be the best you possible always, you have to live in a constant awareness for leadership in action. Constant. That means that you don't come only once a year to a transformational expo to feel better about yourself. Because let me tell you, this is great, but only two days listening to people and getting material won't be enough for your transformation. It has to be constant. But the people of my generation, we were told something different. We were told that education was only the first part of our years. And then we were totally educated. You got your, your diploma, nothing else to learn, and you will make money, be successful, and be happy. But right now, VUCA tells you that what is relevant today, in 10 years, probably will not exist. Look at the future of jobs. How many jobs that we have today will not be in the marketplace in 10 years from now? Like I go to countries in Latin America and I see people like, you know, still, you know, getting the tolls manually. You have to start the car and they, you, you pay and they, you know, get the, the payment for the toll. And I always ask, oh my God, this guy, this lady, is, is she thinking about how she will sustain the family when the electronic toll gets here to this road? It's amazing. How many the world is changing? So you have to understand that every single day, you have to have a part of your day in a constant awareness to higher your leadership levels. And you have to be in action. So it's simple. But let me tell you, for a lot of people, it's not that simple to apply into their lives. Constant awareness for leadership in action. What is awareness? Awareness is to be mindful. What is to be mindful? Stop. Relax. Think and feel. We just did it in a very short exercise a while ago. Stop. Relax. Think and feel. 
If you do that every single day, you will have purpose. Because when you stop, you will have the time to ask these questions. Who am I? What do I want? What is my mission in the world? What is my purpose? Why I was born? The reason, the purpose. And believe me, if you have a purpose that is greater than you as a person, you will have the force inside and outside of you to make that purpose a reality. But if your purpose is as small as you are as a person, then it's always shaking. So that's why we need to stop. I'm here today, and I can tell you that I'm here because this is, until today, the result of the actions that I've taken in the last 10 years, maybe 20 years of my life. And I can tell you that, speaking honestly, because I have two brothers. We have the same genetic components. One of them is suffering with schizophrenia, and the other one didn't deal the right way with all what we inherited, and he had had a lot of problems, troubles. So I can tell you that this stuff works. So that you have to take control of your life, your story. Do not play the victim. Get on the side of leadership. And every single day, say, what have I done for myself today? What have I learned? What new stuff I'm experimenting today? How am I leaving the comfort zone of my only five friends for the last 10 years? You know, people want to grow, but they come to this expo and they leave the expo with no one new contact or new friend. You are the average of the five people closer to you on a daily basis. The five people that you spend the most time with are defining your personality. So you have to ask, okay, let's make that list five. Number one, who is number one? This person. Okay, I'm going to deconstruct the last three months of my encounters with that person. Juanita. Let's say it's Juanita. Juanita in the last three months, every time that she called, what was the purpose? What were her invitations? To have tacos? Only tacos? And to play reggaeton at her house? Oh, let's check how much time I'm spending with Juanita. Because Juanita is a good friend, but she's not making me grow. She's actually making me stay at the same level. How possibly I can be the best you or the best me if I'm hanging out with Hanita every single weekend for 20 hours. So we need to have control of every single aspect of our lives. But you see, people are suffering from excusitis infinitus. Excusitis infinitus. That's an illness. It sounds pretty cool in Latin, but it's a terrible illness. Because you are believing that you have an excuse that it's limiting you to grow. And if you, if you believe it, you're right. Henry Ford said it. If you think it's possible, or if you think it's not possible, in both cases, you're right. Imagine that. We have three minutes left. How are we doing? Is this stuff relevant? Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. This is the most important thing that I will say to you today. And this is a challenge for your brain. Because this is the paradigm that most people have installed in their mindsets and brains. See it to believe it. Seeing is believing. Why? Because we are scientists. We believe in science. I believe in science too. Believe me. I love science. But I know that science only thinks that something is true when they can prove it. And we know that that's not the reality. We know that scientists and brilliant people in this planet five centuries ago 
they thought that the planet was flat, not round. They didn't have the instruments, they didn't have the technology to understand that we, we, we were not on a flat planet. But because that's what they saw, a line in the horizon, that's what they believed in. I was one of these people thinking, show me the numbers and I will believe you. Show me the data and I will then believe you. Show me that it's possible and then I will believe, believe you. And that's totally wrong. If you want to live like that, believe me, you are just one more of the average. You are not rare. You are not eccentric. You are not different. If you want to create an extraordinary life, you have to pay the price of being different, of being awkward, of being eccentric, of being criticized, of being ridiculed. Because any person that now is on a history book page was different, was eccentric, was awkward, was rare. The other ones are cited like the people, el pueblo. The masses. You don't want to be one of those unknown people. You want to create something extraordinary. So you have to believe to see it. You have to understand that here, for instance, if I tell you, tell me things that we have here in this room. Well, probably ultrasound was not on the list Electromagnetic waves was not on the top elements that you will mention out of your brain or infrared light. And I will end asking you this. What do you bring from home here today? Shout, anything, phones, shoes. Tell me, what do you bring from home? A smoothie? A smoothie. You? Open mind, that's beautiful. Oh my God. You should be writers or poets. A book for me to sign for you. I will do that. What else? A notebook, a pen, curiosity, love. What? A toilet? <laughs> okay. Okay. I got you. Because... Maybe you brought the book, but you brought from home tons of other elements with you, more than a book. But because we don't see them, they don't exist until something goes wrong in our body with them. I can tell you, look what you brought today. Bacteria. Bacteria. And look at the numbers. Each of us have 39 trillion bacteria versus 37 trillion human cells. So it's almost one to one, but in some organisms, we can have more bacteria than human cells. But obviously, you don't see them, you cannot touch them, but they are with you. But it's like they don't exist until you have something wrong. You go to the doctor and the doctor said, You have a bad bacteria. We have to fight it. So reality is not what you perceive to be reality. Our five senses are really powerful, but they are limiting. Our five senses are responsible only to perceive the 4% of what is around us. The 96% of reality is not perceivable by our five senses. So what do we need to do? We need to be open-minded. We need to be open to the unknown. We need to open our social circle to new people that probably is frightening at the beginning, but that will be a treasure in your life when they challenge you to grow and to do different things and to try new protocols to install in your life. Because otherwise, you soon will be like a bacteria. Not perceivable by some other interesting people. Because interesting people want to get next to them amazing, 
interesting, outstanding individuals. That's the power of proximity. And that's what we, what we need to create for our lives. So don't be discouraged by VUCA. Yes, we live in a world that is volatile, complex, ambiguous, and uncertain. But this is a world of great opportunities to do a masterful route for our life. Who is a leader here? Raise your hands. Okay, so put your right hand in your heart and say, I commit every single day to love myself, to care for myself, to pamper who I am. Because the most important person in my life is myself. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will sign the book. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co.